name's Dan Berger, and we're standing here in the Iceberg Projects uh, Gallery here in Chicago. And uh, I'm the founder and director of this exhibition space. I also work as a medical doctor and I'm an infectious disease specialist that specializes in the treatment of HIV AIDS, but, um, but recently uh, I've also became uh, uh, specialist, unfortunately, in COVID-19 related uh, uh, diseases. And I'd like to introduce um, uh, Stevie Cisneros Hanley. He's a local Chicago artist who's exhibited widely around the United States as well as Berlin. Um, he also teaches at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, and thanks to you for being with us. Thanks for having me. I'm here in front of uh, Stevie's work. And uh, um, the name of the work is called Care Bear Police. Body and the Care Bear Police. Body and the Care Bear Police. And um, so I titled the show The Care Bear Police. Uh, in fact, and Stevie, why don't you tell us a little bit about the, this work? Yeah, it's a portrait of my brother uh, who was incarcerated, uh, who uh, has schizophrenia. And it was a piece that I really struggled with. I made it for a couple of years, I worked on it, put it away, folded it in half. There's actually quite a bit of stuff on the back of this image, too. And I just had a really sort of uncomfortable relationship a relationship I wasn't sure about, um, not being in uh, the prison system myself, um, not having schizophrenia, uh, but this being someone that is very close to me, my brother, who's 11 months younger than me, trying to figure out how to relate myself to this work and why was I making this piece. I was reading Jean Genet's um, text that he wrote while he was in prison. And a lot of weird things have started to happen over time. Like uh, there were some sexual elements, which was weird. Uh, the portrait started to become sort of a self-portrait, and I thought I wouldn't show it. And then a friend came by, Hendrik Folkert, who's a, a curator at the New York Institute, and he was like, "You know, I think you should show this. I think it's okay that um, things aren't loosely put together, or that things are a little bit messy." Um, spiritually messy, philosophically messy, morally messy. So I decided to show the work. And there's a lot going on in the piece. Um, there's embroidery, there's bits of can in here. A lot of different materials in this piece. Uh, I thought about the Care Bear Police, so this idea of the police being um, caring. Uh, that they're actually teddy bears, which is an absurdist idea and sort of playing with that idea. I thought about that specifically related to my brother because it was the first time that he started to receive help for um, schizophrenia while he was in the prison system through a psychiatrist. And just thinking about thinking about that. And it's interesting that you call it care bear police because obviously, you know, there's been a lot of police brutality yeah. uh, at, the, at this moment and that we have been We've been seeing a lot of protests around the country, in fact, around the world, about how um, um, disenfranchised populations have been victimized uh, by this brutality. And so I think this piece has uh, uh, special um, significance looking at it, especially during this time. Yeah, this work was made, I started this work a couple of years ago, and then it was about what is it, almost a year and a half, two years ago now. And yeah, we live in a really violent country. The US is there's like a death culture, a death cult. We have a lot of gun violence. The police are extremely violent against uh, blacks and against uh, brown people. And it's just, I feel like it's like a constant fixture that would, as an American or as a person of color, you learn to like, live with. And I've been dealing with it in other works recently too. I've had some other experiences with the police, um, and recent events, and yeah, it's, it's something. And it's something I also don't know how to relate myself to, or I feel it's just this sort of constant undertone, overtone of violence in the police. Like I've been doing works about great security trucks, like all different forms of like, the police state. The work has a real generosity and scale. And there's also a, 
sense of the materi materiality. Um, how did you choose the, the materials and what significance did it have when you constructed the piece? I work really I like a collage artist. I, I'm a pack rat. I save things, I organize them, and I sort of throw everything at the image, and then whatever sticks, sticks. What I mean by that is what feels like it has a charge. So some things stay up, some things come down. I'm pretty brutal with like cannibalizing my own work. Like you know, when I cut my own work, I collage a lot of my other paintings and put them together. And it's something that happens over time. I usually work on multiple pieces at once. And I'll go into a sort of fixation with a piece for a few days and then have to take a break from it and come back to it. This one I took for a while, I think I took the longest, maybe six month, a six month break from this and actually folded it in half. Uh, yeah, the, yeah, there's yarn here, there's a little kitty pads and embroidery. It's mostly based in painting and drawing. And I don't know, it's, it's kind of a hard thing to explain how, how, how it works. There's some ballpoint pen on it, some like silk over there, collage elements, there's a little sticker here. And it just comes from being present at the studio, of going into a trance-like state, being there. Um, it's a little hard to explain like that, that space of making. But I've seen you make your own clothes, I think, right? I think, yeah. And I always think about when I see this material and I see this sort of translucent material and I see the stitching, I think about maybe um, queer and, uh, and the type of um, trans um, fashion that's been evolving. Yeah. Um, and I think that perhaps that element is sort of present um, in the work somehow. I think it's really important to be a maker, a maker of all types. And I think especially in the world that we live in where we're just told to consume. Um, and I think a lot of people don't think that they have that power to make, even if that's cooking or if that's making clothes. And also that they have the power to make it in their own way, their own queer, fucked up way. Things can be messy. They don't have to look like they've come from a factory. And sort of, yeah, taking pleasure in that like misuse of things. Sure, and of course sex is always messy. And sex is so always messy. It's not going to be fun if it's not messy, right? <laughs> so, you know, of course you see that uh, here in the work. So, you know, it's great work, and uh, I'm just proud to have this in the show. Oh. Okay, so, work by the Colombian artist, uh, New York-based artist, Carlos Mota. And this is a work from 1998. Um, it is uh, a photograph of the artist um, in a very contorted uh, position, uh, showing us his ass um, in the foreground, but also reflected in, um, in the water. Um, you can see that the artist's hands are, um, there's tension uh, noted, and you can see that the artist also is sporting these extra long fingernails. So there's some femininity, but also some um, tension. There's homoeroticism. Um, um, he's obviously queer. Um, his work has, uh, has been shown uh, widely, and, uh, and most recently a lot of his work deals with uh, queer issues. Um, even age-related issues, um, and um, I think there's a lot of um, similarities between uh, some of the queerness that we can see in this work as well as, in, as, in, as we've seen in Stevie's works. Um, what do you think? Uh, what do you think as an artist, Stevie, when you look at this work? Uh, how do you feel? How does it make you feel? Uh, as you stare at the, at the artist. I'm inspired by like a queer monstrosity. There's something sort of monstrous about it. Um, there's a sort of like uh, feminine monstrosity too with the nails that is empowering. And it, the setting to me seems a little bit fascist in the sense that it's this heavy architecture. I'm not really sure what's happening. Um, and then you have these little elements of nature. You have this leaf on his back. Uh, and then you have this monstrous human, this beautiful human, uh, inserting themselves. 
I think about Bhutto dancing also. Um, yeah, and I'm a little confused by the space, which I appreciate. Like, I don't. I see the reflection of this background, and I don't know if this artist is like in a cylinder or what is this space. I know that there's some nature coming into it, there's leaves falling into it. Yeah, but it's, it's also very gritty, right? The background's very gritty. The water, uh, you get the sense that there's some mud involved. In fact, uh, there's yeah. mud on his back. And you can see that the mud is sort of dripping back down to it, down to its crack, you know. And obviously, um, uh, it's very sexual as well. Yeah. Again, this sort of messy sexual sexuality that sort of creeps into the into the work as well. I like the word gritty too. It's like the grittiness of the, of the dirt on his butt, like you said, and that weird texture of that stone or that cement, whatever that is. And then the sort of softness of the water and the softness of the skin also. Yeah, and in some of his works, you definitely get the sense of sadomasochism. Um, he's often, he often portrays himself tied up. Uh, and a most recent uh, film where he is um, reflecting on David Warner Roberts, who would sell his, uh, mm. his mouth closed. Um, uh, the artist uh, does a video that reflects on, I think, the same same issues. Mm. And there's a piece by David Monrovich here also, which is great, but we have all this work and conversation. So we're standing in front of a painting, a very intimate painting by the artist David Monrovich, and this work was done in 1986. And just as the artist has often portrayed the world, uh, you can see here again uh, path of the world being on track towards self-destruction, where you see buildings pummeling and uh, the detritus of the building uh, lying on the ground. Um, there's a skull, uh, which uh, appears to be as what he called, what is referred to as a spider skull. Um, you see dollar bills. Um, there are dollar bills that are painted over, uh, and you'll see little fragments of dollar bills that are sort of floating in the air. And you see the earth looking down on this uh, occurrence. There's also a little uh, sexual scene going on in one of the other windows. Um, and just as um, uh, common, just as common in many of his works, uh, the artist created his own iconography. And a lot of those elements you see here, you know, the, uh, the earth, the dollar bills, the sexual imagery. Um, but this is an unusual scale for the artist. Most of the paintings that have been shown in a lot of the exhibitions have been very large scale. I fucking love this artist so much. Um, a teacher of mine when I was very young, Captain Sherwood, uh, worked with, um, she called him the Washington she used the, like, the Polish pronunciation of his name um, in New York, and um, she had a lot of anger too, and David had a lot of anger, and a lot of anger based in, in justice, and, um, and injustice in the world that he encountered. So I've always just been super inspired by him, and when I found out that I was in the show with him, I was just shocked and thrilled. Uh, Dan curated the show um, just sort of like on his own, and then Sunny sent me a photo or something, and I was like, oh, you're in the show, with David, and I was just like, what? Um, but no, I, I think I find him really inspiring. Um, he works across different mediums, and even here in this tiny painting, you have this mixed media, um, I don't know, materiality happening, and it's really seamless, and he's kind of messy, too, and kind of like, I'd say like a bad painter in a good way. Like, he's not like obsessed with um, being sort of realist painter going into the Renaissance, uh, he's, it's more this sort of, um, this, this need for like, I need to get something across, and I'm going to paint, I'm going to write poetry, I'm going to do whatever I need to do, I'm going to sew my lips closed, um, and I, I appreciate that. I think that that to me is more powerful and more potent. And that need, uh, he was aware, well aware of his mortality and his, uh, and his death, which only occurred a few years after this painting, when he died in 1992. This work was done in 1986. 
uh, with many of his uh, community members, members of his tribe that are dying around in New York City. Um, he's very well aware that uh, he doesn't have much time. And uh, so he did do things rather quickly and try to get his message across uh, you know, with that sort of guttural um, sensibility, I call it. I think that's a lesson we could all learn, but not to be a perfectionist, especially when time is of the essence. We're sitting in front of a, a work by the artist Sandro Chia, who is uh, Italian, who lives in Tuscany, um, and this is a work of his from 1980, and it's called La Doccia, which means the shower. And this work is incredibly uh, lucent, uh, a really beautiful study of color. Uh, there's a lot of classical uh, posing. It also has uh, a great generosity in size. But as you can see, uh, as you look more closely at the painting, there are things that are just a little uh, unnerving. For example, um, you look at the figures, and although they're naked and uh, it looks very sexual, um, you see that they're very thin. You can see uh, the ribs in, uh, in, this, uh, in this figure. Uh, their eyes are kind of uh, a bit ghostly. Um, there's a figure here. That's a soldier, and he's holding a rifle, and he's feeling a, uh, a red or reddish orange uh, bloody uh, vomit on one of the figures uh, in the shower. Um, and then you know you see a lot of other sexuality. There's uh, some phalluses that are uh, that are here. The shower water is just beautifully painted. Um, so he's juxtaposing. Fascism um, with uh, the uh, brutality of uh, prison, perhaps a prison camp, or perhaps a concentration camp. And you know, personally, uh, my mother was uh, not a concentration camp survivor. She was a survivor of Auschwitz. My father was a, a survivor of slave, Nazi slave labor. And when I see this work, it has uh, you know much more. Uh, significance to me uh, personally. And just as uh, we're living right now during this uh, difficult time of COVID-19 and, uh, and the Black Lives Matter movement and the recent um, uh, celebration and anniversary of Stonewall and, uh, and a lot of our um, rights being threatened by the Trump administration and by the dictates of, uh, of the, of, of the Republican Party, the recent strife that we've had. Uh, so here, you know, back again, you know, we have Senator Kia, who's probably in his 70s, who is probably thinking about either Mussolini or, or some political uh, injustice that was going on uh, during his life. Uh, but at the same time, both Phoebe and Carlos and uh, Juan Rovich uh, all talking about uh, these sort of central issues. Um, different uh, prisoner situation than perhaps the one that, you're, um, that you have in your painting. Yeah, there's a, a lot going on in the shower, and possibly what you said it's something that reveals itself the longer you look at it. When I first saw the first glance, as my heard mind was like, oh, I should make men shower, and how erotic, and then the longer you look at it, you see how unnerving it is, like that figure over there. And, None of them are touching or embracing, and then the fact they're different colors can be sort of it like shows how alienated they are from each other. How separate are, are they? Different temperatures? Like why are they all different colors? What does that signify? And I think it's interesting that he holds both. That there can be the beauty of the water, the beauty of the naked form, like referencing classical imagery, and then also this violence, this dehumanization and how those two things, you can hold both of those things and one doesn't um, diminish the other one. And that can be difficult, but those things can go hand in hand. You know, when I first got the painting, I really struggled with trying to understand what the artist was referencing. Um, it really uh, bothered me that I wasn't 
able to really understand specifically uh, uh, what he was um, trying to teach us. But when this pandemic started, and the more uh, we got to see how uh, brutal the Rohoku administration has been handling the crisis, and then with Black Lives Matter uh, occurring, it, it became clear to me. And this, a work like this could have been done recently, in fact. Um, it's just so clear to me now. Yeah, I think that sometimes we think that artists have to like teach something or show something so that they can ask a question, they can share confusion, they can share like, oh, I see beauty and terror, something terrible, and how, are, how do these two things swirl together? Yeah. And I'm sure, you know, years ago, it might have been a difficult painting to look at, or it might have been a difficult painting to think about, but I think now, living in these times, it certainly, uh, you know, it's certainly a reality. It's certainly, uh, it, it, I'm not saying it, it's easier to look at, but it's definitely easier to identify with. So this work by Christian Halstead, and it was done in 2003. And as you can see, it's in front of a court build, probably a court building, uh, maybe even in the Supreme Court. There are microphones in front of it, but you can see that uh, the artist erased uh, the figures as if there's no one there. Uh, that's perhaps uh, uh, either in government or judging. Um, there are uh, empty microphones. Um, you can kind of see maybe a silhouette of a figure, perhaps in the background, or maybe that's my imagination. Um, but this definitely resonates with me. And at the time um, that uh, that I installed the show, which was you know in March, uh, we didn't have um, we didn't have the uh, we weren't mourning the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And uh, we weren't uh, challenged uh, emotionally uh, by Trump, where he uh, appointed uh, Amy Coney Barrett as a new Supreme Court justice, who's um, very far, uh, very far to the right, and uh, and we believe she's uh, very much against. A lot of the rights that we uh, believe we should have, such as uh, perhaps abortion, and uh, uh, such as Obamacare, you know, healthcare being a right. Uh, but anyhow, looking at this now, um, you know, obviously, um, it, it definitely harkens to the fact that we maybe have missing justice uh, in the Supreme Court show has been up since March, and here we are. Um, today's date is November 22nd, 2020. And uh, so the work has been up here for all, nearly eight months, and it doesn't feel uh, like I should take this, deinstall this show at any time soon, because it doesn't look like uh, change is gonna happen uh, just yet. Um, in any case, it's nice to have you here, and. Uh, give us a perspective on maybe how artists are looking at um, um, this period and how that's affecting um, the work, what's informing your practice, and uh, how, if anything, has anything been changing in terms of um, the work that you're creating right now? Yeah, I think a lot has changed. Um, I know that a lot of artists are dealing with it in different ways, which is great, because there's artists are human, there's so many different types of humans, and people are really dealing with this pandemic with the fascist regime that we have in power in different ways. Uh, there does seem to be a general pause, a slowing down in the art world um, and the whole world as a whole, which has actually felt nice. And I have been questioning to how taking advantage of that, questioning my own motives, and um, sort of trying to step away from this careerist or professional aspect of art, which I think unfortunately too much of the art world seems too consumed by that. And now in this time when commerce are slower, um, when 
things are slower, sort of like questioning questioning that rather than this, I think there's an impulse to sort of like produce all the time, get things out there and thinking like, is that actually the best thing to do? Um, I think about Trump and this sort of like hunger for power, this hunger for attention, um, this hunger to get things out and thinking like, seeing how gross that is and how destructive it is to society, to the environment, like wanting to move further away from that. And like, I don't want to have that like hungry spirit it's never fed it's never satisfied it's always trying to get more and just trying to yeah slow down and be satisfied yeah i've talked to a number of artists and i recently uh was talking to colleen smith the artist colleen who lives in los angeles and she told me that you know for a while uh, after all this started and uh, all the protests and uh, um, she was so outraged. Uh, the sheer outrage just prevented her from being able to function and do any kind of artwork. That she just hadn't been able to go into the studio and produce anything. She was just so upset. Um, I became fixated with cars, like automobile culture, and thinking that that could be something that I could focus my anxieties on. Um, it's something that. I don't know, I can become really consumed in, and it's to me seems there's some things that just like maybe like Colleen Smith, I get too upset by, like uh, thinking directly about the police or thinking directly about other things can become just overwhelming. Yeah, we can talk about anxiety, we can talk about frustration now a lot more easily. I think before all of this, maybe uh, um, anxiety was something that was not uh, brandished or talked about so freely. But I think now that we um, are all having this sort of anxious existence and worrying about what's to come, and especially uh, even though the election is over, for example, we still don't know, uh, you know what the motives are of Trump, who's continuing to try to create these uh, stumbling blocks. I think it's, um, it's unfortunate. I'm hoping that at some point in the future that we're able to, be able to show more joy as opposed to more frustration. Yeah. Yeah. I have a, a, a young student, a high school student, uh, African American student, Tyshawn, who has been making paintings um, about um, gun violence. Um, and they said this morning in class that um, they wanted to do a painting for the final project that is about. Um, uh, black pride and black joy, and that feels really needed to in the world. And I, like what you said just right now, about artists working, um, I don't know, from a place of, of of joy or peace or camaraderie. I'm thinking about that too, um, like world making, rather than just sort of like everything that's wrong. Like how can we envision, how can we envision like radically different places that are uplifting. And it's kind of sad that that seems really hard. Like it's easier for people to imagine a million dystopian things than thinking about utopia seems really like, oh, you're an escapist. It's fancy, but it's so necessary to. Necessary. Yeah. yeah. For us to think about utopia. I think so. Yeah. Well, we have to. Even though about... utopia may not exist. Yeah. Ever. I mean, I don't know if it's going to exist. I think it's. Yeah, we would love to be able to hope every year we. Things are supposed to get better, but they just don't seem to at the moment. Maybe it's just the existence that we're living in. It's a sort of pervasive, um, depressive moment. I mean, I think it's labor and exercise too to think about like how things could be, where they really could be a possibility for that. And if you don't have a vision to go towards that, then how do you motivate? How do you like go forward? Right, you have to be an optimist, right? You have to the same for you know, treating people. If you're going to think that uh, as a medical doctor that people are gonna stay sick or that while you're, or in, you know, or back in the AIDS crisis when we didn't have the treatment for HIV and AIDS, if I were to have this sort of pervasive thought that, uh, it, it, that it was hopeless, then there wouldn't have been motivation on my part to continue doing research and continue to try to uh, make change. So I can definitely understand how, even as artists, thinking along those lines. And what's it all for if we, if we can't accomplish anything? We 
have to believe that we can make change. And it sort of brings a lot, brings or invokes that age old question can art change the world? Hmm. Well, I think we'll leave it here. Uh, thank you for listening to our program. And uh, we hope that Iceberg Projects will be uh, opening up uh, in the early spring, uh, hopefully uh, with, uh, with the vaccine becoming more available. And um, thank you all.